this is John Whitaker, and I'm here for the Probability One class. And uh, last time, uh, we uh, ended uh, Lecture One with some properties of probabilities. And so we're going to start Lecture Two uh, with uh, looking at those uh, properties, examples, and proving uh, those properties. So let's recall what we have. So these are properties. Probabilities. And so what we had was uh, the first one that we had listed uh, was the probability of A is equal to 1 minus the probability of A uh, complement. <clears throat> and so um, the way that we can look at this to see the idea is through something called a Venn diagram. So here, I'm drawing a box, and this box represents the sample space. So this is the collection of anything that could happen for a random experiment. And here we have A. And the way I'm going to think of this is that the probability of S, of this box, is, is 1. So it's like this box S is a piece of land, and it's worth $1. And what we want to know is what's the probability uh, of A, what's the worth of A? And so the way that I'm going to think about that is, well, the worth of A ought to be 1 minus the worth of what's outside of A, which is the probability of A complement. Uh, but that's, that's the idea. It's a good way of uh, seeing it. But uh, here's the way that I'm going to prove it. So my proof is, I'm going to say, no, the probability, well, let's start with 1, is equal to the probability of the sample space. That's an axiom associated with the definition of probability. And that's equal to the probability of A union A complement. So A union A complement is the sample space. So the probabilities of those uh, events are the same, because they are the same. Well, <clears throat> Uh, this is uh, the uh, A union A complement of mutually exclusive events. And so when we take the probability of the union of mutually exclusive events, that's equal to the probability of the first event plus the probability of the second event. <clears throat> so what we have is that 1 is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of A complement. Thus, what we have is the probability of A is equal to 1 minus the probability of A complement. I want to, uh, that is the proof, I want to look at an example where we could use that. Okay, so as an example, let's say uh, a die is rolled twice. And somebody says, uh, let A be the event of uh, at least one even die occurs. At least one even number. So um, somebody says, well, what was the probability of A? So at least one even number. Well, I'm going to take my time here and start off with the, noticing what the sample space is. And even though it takes a few seconds to write it out, I think it's beneficial to look at some practice. So here we have one and one is an outcome. Roll the die of one, roll it again, get one and one on each one of them. If you get 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, 1, 5, and 1, 6. So that's all the ways that the first row could be a 1. Okay? Then you could have gotten the first row to be a 2, and the second row would be a 1. 2, 2, 2, 3, 2, 4, 2, 5, and 2, 6. You could have gotten 3, 1. 3, 2, 3, 3, 
three, four, three, five, and three, six. Could have gotten four, one. Four, two, four, three, four, 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 five, four, six, five, one, five, two, five, three, five, four, five, 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 six. Then you could have gotten six, one, six, two, six, three, six, four, six, five, and six, six. Okay, so those are the possible outcomes uh, from this random experiment. Now remember, our question is to find the probability of getting at least one even. Okay, so I'm going to do this in two ways. Uh, so our question is the probability of at least one even. Okay, well, we'll go back and look at the sample space here for a second. And the sample space I've written out here has 36 uh, possible outcomes. And somebody might say, well, look, why do you say 1, 2 is different than 2, 1? You can think of these as uh, being the, the events that you got a 1 and a 2, and it doesn't matter the order. But it turns out if you don't uh, have order being distinguishing, the sample space that you create is one where not all the uh, outcomes are equally likely. And so to use our definition of a probability when things are equally likely, that is the probability of the number of elements in the event that you're looking for with the number in the sample space, when everything's equally likely. Uh, <clears throat> so to use that, we need to use this sample space for rolling a die. And we found that um, these events are going to be equally likely through experimentation. So that, that's the way they've been determined. So if someone says, well, what's the probability that you get at least one even? Well, let's count the number of ways that we can get an even. So the number of ways I can get an even here uh, are three ways. Then there are six ways here, three ways here, six ways here, three ways here, and six ways here. So overall, there are 18 ways, I'm sorry, 27 ways to get at least one even number. So here, this is equal to, this is the first one, the probability of at least one even, the number of ways of getting at least one even. over the number in the sample space, and that's equal to 27 over 36. Okay. okay, an alternative way, so the probability of at least one even is equal to one minus the probability of the complement of at least one even. Well, uh, the complement of getting at least one die to be even is that none of the die were even. That means that both dies were off. So this is going to be equal to 1 minus the number of ways that both dies were off. Over the number in the sample space. And so if we go back to the sample space, when we say both rows being odd, is what we're looking for. There's one, two, three. There's none here, so three. Then there are four, five, six, uh, six. And there's none in this row. Then there's seven, eight, nine, and none in the next row. So this ends up being for this alternative way. Okay. This is the second way. This ends up being 1 minus, I think we had 9 out of 36, and indeed that's 27 out of 
uh, 36, which is the same answer as what we had before. Okay? So these are just two ways of doing it. This, using the complement counting technique, has us counting uh, less uh, outcomes, if you will, than what we don't use the uh, complement counting technique. And in some problems, this can be more beneficial than others, but this was just an example of it. Okay. The next thing I want to do is look at the, another property of probability, one that we have listed, and that was, well, this is our second property, the probability of A union B is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of the intersection. Again, through a Venn diagram, we get the idea of why this is a true fact. So here, if I consider this box to be the collection of all sample space, and here is the set A, and here's the set B, what they have in common is what's overlapped, that's the intersection between A and B. Then what we're trying to say is, uh, what we're trying to ask is, if we think of this box uh, being worth one dollar, probability of this box, worth one dollar. We want to say, well, what's the probability or the worth of this region plus this region? This region is the way I should say it. The two circles combined, union together. Well, the answer is it should be worth this uh, amount, which is the probability of A, plus the probability of B. But we've counted this region twice. And so we need to subtract its worth one time. And that's where this subtraction is coming into play. Um, that's the idea. So let's look at the proof. Okay, so here, uh, to look at the proof, <clears throat> what I'd like to consider uh, is for us to note that the probability of uh, A is equal to the probability, well, let me write this a little bit lower. Probability of A is equal to the probability of A minus A intersect B plus or I'll say uh, union. No, that's what that is. Uh, um, plus the probability of uh, A intersect B. I've really said this a little faster than I want to. So it's this plus the union A intersect B. Okay, that's what I'll write. So here, the probability of A, all of this, right here is equal to the probability of the part of A that doesn't include the intersection, um, plus, that's union, the part that, of A that does in, uh, include the intersection between A and B. It is the intersection between A and B. Now, when I look at these two events, you can see as sets, this set and this set uh, are mutually exclusive. They can't happen at the same time. And we're taking the probability of a union. So that's equal to the probability of A minus A uh, intersect B um, plus the probability of A intersect B. That's what we have for the probability of A. Similarly, the probability of uh, B is going to be equal to the probability of B minus if you will, A intersect B, union A intersect B. And again, these are mutually exclusive events. So that's equal to the probability of B minus A intersect B plus the probability of A intersect B. So the next thing we're going to do is, is see that the probability of A plus B plus probability B 
it's really equal to, well, it's the probability of A minus A intersect B plus the probability of A intersect B plus the probability of B minus A intersect B plus the probability of A intersect B. That's what those two things are if we add them together. So that yields the probability that A uh, plus the probability B is equal to, uh, just straightening things up here, when we write this is the probability of A minus A intersect B plus the probability of B minus A intersect B plus 2 times the probability of A intersect B. Uh, well, let's leave those separated. So probability of A intersect B plus the probability of A intersect B. So I'm just rewriting it, reorganizing it. And here, um, what you can see, especially from the Venn diagram, so I'll quickly draw it over here to the side. It's A minus A intersect B, that's this part of A. And B minus A intersect B, that's this part of B. When you, when you uh, take the probability of this plus the probability of this, if you just look at these two regions, right here and right here, they're mutually exclusive. And so what we get is the probability of A plus the probability of B is equal to the probability of, well, Really, these two things are mutually exclusive, but also, uh, so is this, uh, A intersect B, but I'll take my time here and add these three together to get, the, they're all mutually exclusive events, and they, you, or they add up, if you will, union up, and I'll write it down this way, A minus A intersect B, uh, union with B minus A intersect B, Union with A intersect B, A intersect B. So here, I'll put a big bracket, plus the probability of A intersect B. So these sets that I'm taking the probability of are, are this set, this set, and this set. Adding them together, and since all those sets are mutually exclusive, then we just union them up. But when I union them up, what I get is the probability of A union B plus the probability of uh, A intersect B. Okay, so that's what the probability of A plus B is. So that says the probability of A union B is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A intersect B. And that's the proof of the fact that we're trying to prove. Well, the next thing we're going to do is an example. So as an example, let's say a, a die is rolled twice. Um, let event A equal to uh, the event uh, at least, or let's just say, a, at least one, two occur. 
least one, two of those. Let B equal to the dent that uh, both rows are even. And someone says, find the probability of A union B. So I'm going to uh, write out uh, sample space in terms of a quick fashion. Uh, we could have 1, 1, 1, 2, all the way up to 1, 6. We could have had 2, 1, 2, 2, all the way up to 2, 6. 3, 1, all the way up to 3, 6. 4, 1, all the way up to 4, 6. 5, 1, all the way up to 5, 6. 6, 1, all the way up to 6, 6. Okay. If somebody says the probability of A union B, well, let's see what that is. So the probability of A union B is equal to the probability of at least one two uh, union with uh, both rows being even. And so we can think of this in terms of uh, at least one of these things has to happen. You either got at least one, two, or both rows were even. Um, and so what is this equal to? Well, um, here, if we go back and think of the number of ways that at least one row is two, or both rows are even. Over the number in the sample space, and we'll go back and look at the sample space. Okay. I'll go back here. I check. The, uh, the cases where you got at least one, two, or both rules are even. So one, two happens uh, uh, once okay? uh, in this row. Uh, uh, that's the only time, uh, case it happens here. And here, um, it happens at least one, two. It happens uh, one time there. It happens six times here. Okay, where both rules are even, or at least one, two, that happens once here. Where both rows are even, or at least one, two. So it happens at four, two, it happens at four, four, it happens at four, six, so that's three times. Uh, here there's a five, two, okay, it's the only event in this row where it happens. And here it happens three times that that event occurs. Okay? So that's seven, eight, 11, 12, 15. So our answer here is 15 out of 36. Of course, that reduces. That's 5 out of 12. Sort of puts in the boat. Okay, so that's what we have. So that's one way of doing it, but it doesn't use the property. Now, using the property, if we uh, say, no, uh, if we look at the probability of A, that's the probability of uh, at least 1, 2. Okay, so here, our probability of A union B, we calculated, it was 15 over 36 or 512. And now looking at another way, probability of A, probability of at least 1, 2. So if I go back and look at the sample space, 
I count the ways that I have at least one two. So there's a one here, there's six here, there's one, uh, one, one, and one. That ends up being six, and one is seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Okay. So our answer for this question, uh, the probability of at least one, two, is eleven out of thirty-six. Okay, well let's look at the probability of B. That's the probability that both dies are even. Okay, so we'll go back, look at our sample space, count the number of ways we can have both dies even. That happens no, no times in the first row. It happens three times here, none here, three times here, none here, three times here. That ends up being nine. So my answer here is nine out of 36. And, and then I think I've got a little space here. The probability of A intersect B, let me do this kind of here on the side. This is the probability of at least one, two, and both even. So if I come over here to the sample space again, come over here to the sample space again, I'm looking for at least one, two, and both uh, die being even. Uh, that doesn't happen any time here. Here, uh, at least one, two, and both of them being even happens three times. Uh, both of them being even doesn't happen at all here. Here it happens once, none here, and once here. So that ends up being five times. So here, this is five out of 36. So if you look at trying to use our property, which I'll do over here to the side, on this side. We say the probability of A union B is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A intersect B. For this particular problem, what we end up getting is answers is this one was uh, 15 over 36, okay? Plus this was 11 uh, over, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I wrote down the wrong thing. The probability of A if we look back, it was 11 over 36. The probability of B was 9 over 36 minus the probability of A intersect B. That was 5 over 36. And so what we do get here is 20 is 15 over 36, and that was what we got for the probability of A union B when we just did it with uh, using the number of ways of A union B over the number of ways in the sample space. So this is just an example of where uh, we see that that property is true. Okay, um, the last property I'm not going to do an example of, but uh, I just wanted to uh, list it. Uh, so this third one. The probability of the empty space is equal to zero, and I want to prove it. And so the way that we prove this is that we're called that one is equal to the probability of the sample space union, uh, which can be thought of as the probability of the sample space union the empty set because the empty set added to the sample space just yields the sample space. And these are mutually exclusive events. They don't have anything in common. And so that's equal to the probability of sample space plus the probability of the empty set. And so here's what we have. So 1 is equal to the probability of the sample space plus the probability of the empty set. So 1 is equal to, so the probability of the sample space is 1. 
plus the probability of the empty set. That's what we have. And so that tells us that the probability of the empty set must be equal to zero. Let me write that down. thing that I want to do is uh, talk about something called uh, conditional probability. Conditional probability. So let me write up the definition of this. It says uh, let A and B be two events Here you see why we have to have the probability of B being uh, non-zero. Okay, before I move any further, let me say something about the idea here. Um, really, we think of the given as more information. The given is more information. And so we're asked for the probability of A, knowing that something else has occurred. Knowing that something has occurred. And so it should help us um, in terms of computing that probability of A. Let's look at a very simple example. Let's say a, a card is selected. Selected at random, that means with every card equal to the platform, uh, from a well shuffled deck.
Okay, so that's our questions. Let's see if we can find the answers. Okay, so again, what we're thinking about is that we're just selecting a card from a standard deck, uh, playing cards. And in that standard deck, there are 13 hearts, there are 13 diamonds, and the hearts and diamonds are red uh, colored cards. And then there are 13 spades, they're black, and there are 13 clubs, and they're black cards as well. So the first question was probability of a heart. Okay, well, this is the number of ways of getting a heart over the number in the sample space. And the number of parts we just said was 13, the number in the sample space is 52. Okay. So that's one for it. So that's the chance of getting a heart without knowing anything. But the second question says, what's the chance you got a heart given that you got a red card? So they're telling you, you got a red card. And so this is the probability of, uh, <clears throat> of a heart and red card, that intersection, over the, the probability of, of uh, uh, getting a red card, I'm sorry. So when I work with this definition, Probability of a heart and red card. So if you think about all the possible ways that you could get a heart and a red card, there are 13. That means you got a heart. And that's over 52. All over the probability of getting a red card, uh, there's 26 red cards out of 52. So this is a complex fraction. This ends up being 13 over 26, which is a half. Yeah, that's right. And uh, part C, the probability of getting a heart given a black card, well, that's the probability of a heart and a black card, that's an intersection, over the probability of black, black card was selected, and then it's equal to, well, the ways that you can get a heart and a black card, there are no ways. So this is zero out of 52. This event, Heart intersecting with black card is really the empty set, so it's zero. Over the probability of black card, well, there are 26 black cards out of the 52, and so we end up getting zero out of 26, which is zero. So I hope through this example, it's clear uh, that this additional information of the given changes the probability of getting a heart. So here it was 13 out of 52. Probability to get a heart in red card was 13 out of 26. Probability of heart is when they tell you you got a black card. That's 0 out of 26. I'd like to do a little bit more complicated example. So let's say, as another example, an urn uh, contains eight light bulbs and uh, three uh, red bulbs. Okay. Two bowls are selected. One after another. Uh, without replacement. And then the question is, is uh, find the probability that the second ball is white. Given the first ball is red. So that's our question. Okay, I'm going to do this using the uh, definition of conditional probability. It's a conditional probability question. And so here the answer is this is the probability that the second 
is y and the first uh, is red. So I'll write it down this way. Probably the first is red and this intersection. Uh, second is y over the probability that the first is y. So here, this is probability of RW over the probability of, I was right now, first is y. Okay, this uh, top probability that we're trying to find, so I'm going to do this in terms of uh, counting techniques. And so the first thing I asked myself was how many ways could I've gotten a red ball on the first trial, on the first uh, region? Well, there are three ways. And how many ways, three is one of those three ways, how many ways could I've gotten a white ball on the second drawing? Well, there's eight. Okay? So I'm using the sequential counting principle there. And this is over how many ways could I have chosen a first ball? Well, there are 11 ways. And for each one of those 11 balls that were chosen, there are 10 ways to choose the second ball. All that divided by, so that's probability of red uh, and white. All that over, the probability that the first is white. Well, there are um, eight ways. I'm sorry. Uh, here, I've miswritten this. This was the probability that the first should be uh, red. So I made a mistake here. So this should be first is red, that's what's given to us. So uh, now how many ways are out there that the first is red? So uh, here there are three balls that can be chosen when first is red. Uh, and then we're choosing another ball, so the question is, is how many ways could that other ball be chosen for each one of these possible ways of getting red ball? And the answer there is 10. All over, here how many ways can the first ball be chosen? There's 11, and then there's 10 ways here. For choosing the second ball for each one of the ways. So here's what we get. We get 3 times 8 all over 11 times 10 times the flip of this fraction, which is 11 times 10 all over 3 times 10. And so uh, the 11 10 here cancels with that. The 3's cancel. We're left with 8 over 10, which is, of course, 4 fifths. That's the answer to the problem. I do want to say something here about uh, conditional probability, and that is it could be considered a, a lot easier to calculate than maybe what I did using this definition in this particular case. Let me write up a specific fact. So, as a fact, uh, when all uh, outcomes of the experiment are equally likely. We may um, reduce the sample space to only the given events and then compute the probability of A uh, from this reduced sample space to get the probability of A given B, uh, regular problem. Uh, as an uh, example of this, let us think back, let us think back to the problem where we had the cards, for example, the cards, uh, one card selected,
probability of, uh, of heart given red? Well, the answer was, if you'll remember, it was one half, it was 13 out of 26. And that's the, exactly what we think about it. Imagine being in the position of having uh, a red card given to you. And so um, that you know it's a red card. So there's only 26 red cards. Uh, ace through king of hearts and ace through king of diamonds. So you got one of those cards. Out of those cards, 26 cards, what's the chance that you got a heart? Well, there's 13 hearts out of those 26 cards. And so that's one half. That's what we can think of. Similarly, let's look at this urn problem. Back to what we have in the CERN So here's what we have. So remember, the urn had eight white balls and three red balls, and two balls are selected one after another. Uh, without uh, replacement, when we're find, trying to find probably the second is white, given the first is red. So imagine taking uh, out a red ball. Then what does our urn have in it? It has eight whites and two reds. And so when you're looking at that urn, after having drawn a red ball, and you're asked what's the probability of just getting a white ball from this situation, the answer should be eight out of, there are ten balls that could be chosen, and that was the fourth fifth, which was the answer to this problem. So the reduction of sample space, uh, when everything's equally likely, makes sometimes finding uh, a conditional probability an easy thing to do. But we still have this other definition. We have another. Uh, we have a definition for it. Okay, so that's uh, kind of important to, to know. Okay. Um, I'd like to write up a fact. that comes from the definition of conditional probability. So, uh, as a fact, probability of A given B times the probability of B. So that just stems directly from the definition of the conditional probability. So here's the truth. The probability of A given B is equal to the probability of A intersect B over the probability of B. Uh, so the probability of A given B times the probability of B uh, is equal to the probability of A intersect B. Okay. So that's what we have. That, that's the, the, the fact. Now this fact works when the probability of B is different uh, uh, than zero. Um, that's what we have. It turns out the fact is true even when prob uh, probability of B is, uh, is zero, but I've just done the proof for it for when the probability Greater than zero. Okay. Um, let's look at an example. If we uh, take a look at the probability from our urn problem, so urn has eight white, three red, two balls selected without replacement. Somebody might ask, what's the probability that uh, first is red? And second is white. Well, that's equal to the probability of red and white. Okay. 
And so here's what I'm going to think of. That's the probability that uh, the second is white, given the first is red, times the, the probability that the first is red. And this is easy to calculate in this situation. Conditional probabilities aren't always easy to calculate, but they're usually easy to calculate when you're asked what happens next, given what happened first. Okay, that's usually easier to calculate. Um, so here, we know that uh, the red ball was chosen first, so that means there's eight white and two red left, and what's the chance we got a white? It's 8 out of 10. 8 out of 10. And the chance that the first woman is white, first, um, first ball is red, I should say. Well, the number of ways that could happen is 3 out of 11. Uh, okay? And then times, if you will, 3. I shouldn't say 3 out of 11. There's 3 ways for the first one to get uh, white, and then they uh, get red. And then there's eight ways for the second, no, sorry, ten ways for the next ball to be chosen. That's over 11, ball, 11 ways to choose a ball times uh, ten ways to choose the second ball once the first ball has been chosen. And so this ends up being, um, if you will, eight times three all over uh, 11 times ten. So that's our answer for this. You can kind of consider that an easier way to compute the probability of red than white uh, chosen. Okay, um, I had said that computing this conditional probability of what happens next given what happens previously is not so bad to do by the fact of putting ourselves in the given situation and reducing the sample space. But the other way uh, where we're asked to find the probability of what happened earlier given what happened next, that usually is uh, more difficult to compute. But we have a formula that helps us compute that, and we'll look at that formula, which is called Bayes' Theorem, uh, next time. Thank you very much.